Welcome back to Norma Jean Discovering Truths, the companion podcast to Marilyn Behind the Icon. This is Gary Viteco Robles, and I'm joined by my collaborators. Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Nina Bosky. And I'm Randall Libero. And we're going to talk about episode six, Lonely Escape into Dreams. So if you haven't heard that episode yet, go check it out and you can come back to this conversation. Yeah, before you listen to us, because that will make sense, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> first things first. Yes. So this so episode begins with a scene that Randall and I created coming out of the factual reference of memoirs by Sidney Skolsky and Natasha Lytess. And that is Marilyn as an adult now seeking out her biological father. So there are dramatized scenes, but we pulled it from facts, didn't we, Randall? Yeah. The relationship between Marilyn and Skolsky is well known. It's documented in several biographies. And of course, that relationship was important to Marilyn. And she trusted Sidney as a friend and trusted him with very revealing parts of her personality and her past. So this conversation, we wanted to highlight that relationship. It's a relationship that even some of the fans may not be aware of. But for Marilyn, it was a very important relationship. So we're talking about this period early on in her life. It's 1951. So that's where we're starting this episode. So you have to remember in Marilyn's career and what her films are. And she refers to Let's Make It Legal. Uh, so this is before her big movies when she's still kind of an ingenue actress in Hollywood. And what this kind of represents to me is Marilyn's father hunger. You know, her, her father abandoned her at birth, uh, never claimed her, and then rejected her later. And so there's really like two fathers in Marilyn's mind. There's the actual man who didn't want her. And then there's like the psychological father, this fantasy that she created for herself uh, of this man who would maybe someday appear and rescue her and want her. And I just have to share something with you guys because I can imagine for any little girl out there that either did not grow up with a dad or had a dad that just wasn't present, that what you were talking about, Gary, rings home. And so as you were just saying that, I thought about it because my father died when I was eight months old. So different circumstance. Yes. However, you use the word hunger and I thought, wow, that's an interesting word. And I thought, wow, definitely you do have that hunger. At least I did. And then if you put on top of that another layer, which he rejects her again. And so it's a double whammy, at least with me, I heard, oh my gosh, your dad loved you so much, right? In this yeah. case, we don't even hear any of that. And it's, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Yeah, it's a very deep longing that she had. And it becomes like a craving, a craving for a father figure, a protector. And so for a young woman, this can be extremely confusing because you can confuse the hunger for a father figure with love. When I was and younger, that's what I did. You're right on when you're saying this. It can make a young woman vulnerable to be targeted to men whose intentions are not honorable. Growing up with a father, you know, the role of a father to protect and love and help uh, a young girl understand healthy relationship. He has an expectation that the man that his daughter will partner with will be a good man deserving of her. But unfortunately, what can happen is that groomers can be seeking out that young girl as a target to meet their own needs and to use. And so that is kind of Marilyn's experience very early in her life, seeking out this father figure and having connections with various men who are older than she is. I mean, if you look at her relationship with Johnny Hyde, her significant agent, he was 31 years older than she was. Wow. Joe DiMaggio and Arthur Miller are more than 10 years older than she was. So she's, she's longing for this father figure and that's who she chooses as her partners. Well, you know, and if you think about it, what do these father figures or a, a healthy father figure would represent, which is safety? emotional safety, physical safety, right? So yeah, yeah, her childhood being so fragmented, I mean, that would be a yearning that any little girl would have, um, any child would have, it doesn't even have to be a little girl, it could be a little girl or a little boy when you're not safe, emotionally safe, particularly in this case, how you'd be drawn to men that appear to be safe. And I say- you know, There's that old um, <laughs> saying that when you're hungry, even what tastes bitter, 
taste good. Yeah, that's a good. That's and a so good it, one. it can yeah. set us up for having a lower bar or a lower standard in what we're willing to accept from our yeah. partner. And when I think about young Marilyn at this point, she lived knowing her father never wanted to claim her and she wanted to find a way to get his attention. And she fantasized that if she became a movie star, she could earn his love. So she, in this episode, she becomes an actress. Her name is on the billboard. She's becoming someone. So she's thinking, if I'm not worthy, maybe my accomplishments will make me worthy. Oh, and that then, just breaks my heart. And you even know? with that, this man is unwilling to participate in her life. And you know, Gary, you're bringing up a really good point about today. There are so many young girls who want to become actresses, but not because they really want to act, but they really do want to be loved. And you think about how desperately Marilyn wanted to be loved. And so, so many people are seeking the fame without the level of work that actually Marilyn put into it. You know, there's a lot of people today that just mm-hmm. want the fame. They want the glory without the guts, right? You know, so Marilyn, interesting enough, a lot of people don't know she had the guts. She, she went in there and she actually worked hard at her craft. And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions because she played her character so well that most people just thought she was this ditzy character in real life. And that's, as you're getting to know her, this is far from the truth, right? Yeah. You know, Nina, you reminded me of what Ben Lyon, one of her early agents at Fox said. He said that while some of the other young starlets were sleeping until 11 o'clock, Marilyn was up at the crack of dawn and she was visiting the various departments at Fox and she was trying to learn everything about movie making. She was taking fencing lessons and dancing lessons and acting lessons. Yeah. And and back then they had to do it all, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it was kind of like entertainment college for young people on campus. And a lot of them were young and impulsive and and wanted a party. (laughs) But Ben Lyon's impression was that, you know, Marilyn took this seriously. She wanted to educate herself. She was a very hardworking starlet. Well, and speaking of a hardworking starlet, one that came before her was Mary Pickford. And we certainly have her in this episode. So Randall, you you crafted this uh, character quite well in this as well. So tell us why you chose this scene. Well, it it actually happened. (laughs) Um, that's the that's the first thing and people, people don't know. We wanted to tie a number of things together. First of all, you know, the hand and footprints at the Chinese theater. But also Marilyn's, and I was just before the, us doing this recording, I asked Gary, I said, is there any instance of Marilyn talking about Mary Pickford anywhere? We weren't able to really find any, but here's the thing. Gary you and I have both, the evidence, Randall. Yeah, I have the evidence. You have it. <laughs> <laughs> so here, Who here, knew? here's the evidence, everybody, that why we know this and why it's in there. Because Marilyn was looking at the career of Mary Pickford. And if you don't know who Mary Pickford is, she's one of the founding artists of United Artists, along with Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, her husband, and D.W. Griffith, the director. And this is in the silent era. So if you don't know about the silent era of movies, you're going to have to go look this up. (laughs) So in the silent era, this was the first independent studio that was founded by people actually working in the industry as artists. That's why they call it United Artists. So Mary Pickford was the first working under a stu- her own studio, a producer. Now, there were other women producers and other women directors and other women screenwriters and other women editors. Matter of fact, most of the films of the silent era were edited by women. And that's another little tidbit. Yeah, I did, you know what? That's really interesting. Yep. I didn't know that They either. were edited by women. Wow. So, and Pickford knew this. Pickford knew these women, such as Gladys and Grace, who were working, cutting her movie. And she she was aware of this. She was aware of what was going on. So there's a lot of these things all tied together. Uh, And as you know, Marilyn extensively and deeply studied the careers of actresses before her. Uh, Of course, her favorite being Jean Harlow. But she studied, you know, Greta Garbo and uh, Molina Dietrich and several other actresses of that period, Betty Davis, many others. So Mary Pickford held a special place for Marilyn. And matter of fact, in the auction lot, one of the auction lots that we have, I bought, that has to do with uh, Anna Lauer. And we're going to talk about Anna Lauer in a later episode in Marilyn's time of living with with Anna, Aunt Anna. Uh, She wasn't really her aunt, but she called her that. She was Grace Goddard's aunt. In, in the lot that I have, there was an article that Anna sent to Marilyn. And it's an article about Mary Pickford and Buddy Rogers adopting a baby. 
So that's something that's a very personal communication. I actually have some letters that Anna Laura sent to uh, Marilyn as well. A letter that was written for her 21st birthday and so forth. And we'll cover all of that later on. So something to look forward to. Uh, but so we, we have certain things that are not published that are private uh, memorabilia from Marilyn that we're also putting into these episodes. So this Mary Pickford piece is one of those. And Randall, wow. you, you kind of reminded me of how Mary Pickford was a role model for Marilyn and, and how their careers had similarities. I'm thinking, you know, Marilyn eventually established her own motion picture company and her, her screen image was in such contrast to who she was as a woman. Like, like Mary Pickford always played a young girl with curls even yeah. into her 30s. And Marilyn, uh, of course, played uh, the, the dumb blonde um, image and both of their images were so different than the shrewd business women that uh, they were in real life. Yeah, they were, you know, just like Lucille Ball, they were very particular of how their image came across. And it wasn't something that just was haphazard and just, it just, you know, happened. It was very, in some ways, very calculated in how they portrayed themselves. And, you know, today it would be called a brand, you know, back then it was an mm -hmm. image, but it's, yeah, it was right. their brand and they were going to make sure that they had control over their brand. And we even hear this when you, when she's talking about rain right you know when she talks about having a lot more control over you know her future and that was really important to her she didn't want to just give it up to a director or producer or the studios anymore she really wanted to mm -hmm. have a lot more control and she didn't want to play that role in goodbye charlie where she is a male mobster who's reincarnated into the body of a woman she felt that that role would be unfeminine Right. That role not. eventually went to Debbie Reynolds. I um, love that movie, though, I have yeah. to tell you. <laughs> it, it's kind of a, I've seen it. It's kind of a fun film, but it's it is a, fun it is a, it is a stretch as a concept, though. It, it really, it really is. It's just kind of, it's just one of those very silly over the top films. So we're talking about with Rain, uh, Marilyn's conversation about that. That's actually in episode two. So if you haven't heard that yet, uh, go check out episode two, A Promise of Hope. Uh, but continuing and, with Pickford, um, and Marilyn, and again, um, that Marilyn was the second woman in Hollywood to have her own independent production company after Pickford. So that's, and, and act in her own movies. So that was, she was the second woman in Hollywood to do so that. So that's also a piece of Randall, film Lucille Ball also had her own production company. Before, yeah, with Desilu Studio and yeah. all of that. Yeah, yeah. so Lucy. that was, you know, if you look right. at those three women, Lucille mm -hmm. Ball, Mary Pickford, Marilyn Monroe, they certainly came across on screen one way, but all three of them are powerhouses, women, and shrewd business women to some degree, you know? So, yeah, if you look at Lucy's early movies, they're very different from her TV personality. Yeah, yeah, very much so. <laughs> and, very, you know, very different. another part of this, uh, this episode, we really get to see, and this is an interesting scene because you can really kind of feel Marilyn or Norma Jean in this case, how she keeps spending all day at the theater. Let's talk about this English couple, her mother, and that time in her life. So, yeah, when she goes to live with her mom, her mom has to work, and she also has to afford the mortgage on this home. So she sublets the house to a, an old a British couple with an adult daughter and Gladys and Norma Jean actually live on the second floor um, but during the day there's no one to supervise uh, Norma Jean so the English couple drop her off at the Egyptian theater and this is Marilyn talking about her childhood from the Georges Belmont interview and she remembers being taken to the Egyptian theater where I, I think there were monkeys in cages in the forecourt that she'd spend time with and then they would the adults would leave and she would pretty much spend the entire day in the theater and told to come home when it's dark. And she and talks about not knowing when it was dark because she was watching these movies all day again and again and again. And yeah. so for a woman who, you know, those other episodes were called My Life is Kind of Grim. Well, the motion pictures of the time created kind of an escape and a fantasy for her. And there weren't yeah. adults around to tell her about the world and about life. So she was learning about life through these films, uh, through the filter of these films and by the women that she was seeing on screen. And can you think, you know, today, if you, you were at the movie theater 
and you saw this little girl by herself at what, six years old, something like that, right? And obviously by herself watching a movie, we would be highly, highly concerned. And two actresses that are friends that in this scene with Juliana Alden, who is our Norma Jean, who plays this really well, it's Devin Green and Stephanie Idelson. It's amazing to watch the scene play out given the fact that she was so young and she was by herself from the time, you know, early in the morning to nighttime and having to come home by herself. I just walk home in the yeah, dark, walk home in the yeah. dark. Right. Yeah. And, and not, not eat. eat. Yeah. yeah. Even <laughs> George Belmont even asked her in the interview, well, you know, what about, how did you get anything to eat? And I think she says, well, you know, I, I figured there'd be food for me when I got home. Wow. So it's, it's likely she did not eat. And so, and, yeah. Do anything? Do we know anything more about this English couple at all? Who are they? Well, you're going to learn about them in, in um, episode seven, but they're oh, believed good. to be yes. a man named George Atkinson, who okay. was a stand-in for the actor George Arliss. And it becomes very significant in the next episode, uh, who he is and the role that he might have played. So Norman listen, life. yeah, listen to that one. And also, you know, the time and the era, you know, we hear a lot about how Marilyn really looked up to Jean Harlow, but there was other actresses that she looked up to too, right? Yeah, there was Carol Lombard, who was a blonde married to Clark Gable, who was a wonderful comedian, a very wonderful actress who unfortunately died young in a plane crash uh, promoting war bonds. And Jean Arthur, who had kind of a Monroe-esque voice. She was uh, comedic and yep. had a high-pitched voice. Mm -hmm. Ginger Rogers, Norma Shearer. Um, and then there were also the, the very strong images of women, uh, Joan Crawford, Betty Davis. They were both making many films each year, uh, respectively at MGM and Warner Brothers. Oh, and of wow. course, Clark Gable, yeah. who plays a significant role in Marilyn's childhood. When she begins visiting and then living with her mother, she sees her father's photograph and he looks very similar to Clark Gable with the pencil mustache. Yeah, and we have fedora. that on our website too. So if you want to it check really it out, but I have to say that when we were going through rehearsals and Aaron Gavin, who plays our Marilyn and our Clark Gable, who is played by Ron Hayden, I was looking down and I was just listening and I thought for just a moment, I forgot that they were actors. And I really thought in this scene that I was listening to Marilyn Monroe and Clark Gable. You were fly you know? on the wall of, <laughs> yeah. at Romanoff's. And then you, you know? put, you, you look up on Google that scene where they're actually dancing and you could just imagine this being played out. And uh, it's and really- We have the powerful. photos on our website. It really <laughs> happened. If you go to a November 1954 Life magazine, it's Life goes to a Hollywood party and it was actually mm -hmm. Charles Fellman and Billy Wilder's reception for Marilyn uh, was at the rap party for the seven year it itch, but it was also kind of a, a debut of Marilyn's entree into the elite inner circle of Hollywood. Now she was considered wow. very powerful at the time that she completed the seven year itch. Well, and here he is the king of Hollywood and think about that as a little girl, you're dreaming of one day and maybe even associating that that could be your dad, right? And then all of a sudden here you are dancing with that dad-like father figure. And on top of it, you really are one of the most powerful women or people actually in the room. That must be an, a pretty surreal experience, I could only imagine. And it, it speaks to me in terms of visualizing what you want for your future. As a little girl, Norma Jean wanted Clark Gable to be her father. And she envisioned getting into the movies and getting the attention of people who would love her. And she meets Clark Gable and they visualize working together. And that also comes to fruition. And can we talk about that a little bit more for anybody that is listening to this and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I don't have the right resources. I don't have enough money. I don't have whatever it is to do this. Think about the fragmentation that this little girl came from. She visualized her future. She is the ultimate dreamer, if you really think about it, and what power we all have to create the realities that we want, especially if we're healthy when we're doing it. And the fact that she could create as much as she did, even in her short life of 36 years, I mean, that's a lot of power. Don't you think, guys? She made it happen. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is yeah. it's pretty amazing when you think as we're writing these and all the fact checking and research and things that we do, 
I always have to stop and remember this woman would only live to age 36. It's like, you gotta yeah. be kidding me. I'm continually amazed by that fact that how much she accomplished in her very brief time on in this world. So, And the fact that she actually has a longer legacy than she was alive at this point, right? So yeah. it's just, uh, it's pretty powerful. So is there any other things we want to discuss before we close out this episode? Yeah, I did want to talk a little bit about the earlier scene when, when Norma Jean is living with her mother and uh, her mother gets the news that when of her children has died and how that Norma Jean did not even know at age seven that she had a brother. So she finds out about Jackie. And that's got to be very confusing too, really. Yeah. yeah. So she finds that, you know, she has a a brother and then probably soon after, although we don't talk about in the episode that she has a a sister, but that'll be forthcoming. Yeah. But now that she realized she has she has siblings. I mean, that never probably even dawned on her at this time in her life that she had. And, and do we sister. know also, I mean, maybe it's in Bernice's book, but were they ever really close at all, Bernice and Marilyn? When uh, they, they maintained contact, Norma Jean went to visit Bernice and her husband, Paris, and they maintained contact through the 40s. Marilyn uh, went to the Detroit area where they lived. They visited through Canada. There's pictures of Bernice also in Los Angeles with Gladys, their mother, and Norma Jean when she first became Marilyn Monroe. Um, after she was signed at Fox, there's um, photographs of them with other supportive women in Marilyn's life at a Chinese restaurant. They kept in touch. I, I have some of their correspondence. Wow. Um, We know that uh, Bernice went to New York uh, to help Marilyn uh, recover from a surgery in the summer of 1961. Oh, wow. But Marilyn was very protective of her family, and um, she tried to keep her family out of the spotlight. She didn't want the press uh, hounding them, seeking them out, disturbing them. So she kept her family a secret. She kept Bernice a secret. And some of that is revealed in the letter that I own that, that Bernice wrote to Marilyn when her phone number was disclosed to the press. I know we're going to have to uh, do some episodes uh, in later seasons, including Bernice. Between the two of you, you've accumulated uh, some really good juicy details that (laughs) a lot of the public doesn't (laughs) know. And nor do they take the time. I think that somebody had just mentioned to me, they said, wow, I'm listening to these episodes. I'm, I'm starting to really hear much more of the details because so much of her life is focused around her death instead of these aspects that kind of not only lead to her death, but lead to why she did some of the things that she did during her brief time here on earth. I find it really, really fascinating too. So in our last episode of Norma Jean podcast, we're going to answer some of your questions because we know that on social media, you've been asking uh, some of these questions and we'll make sure that we try to answer as many as we can, but also kind of follow what happened in this episode too. And you can follow us on Facebook. It's uh, behind the icon.com Facebook uh, dot com slash behind the icon or you can go to our website which is behind the icon sign up for the newsletter make sure if you want to listen to more of these episodes that you subscribe to the podcast rate us please because we really want the truth of Marilyn to come out and this is probably one of the most accurate experiences that you will find that's out there because there's books that's been written about her. We're obviously taking it from Gary's book, but we've used a lot of sources to be able to create this podcast for you. And a lot of time and detail went into it. And uh, we couldn't do it without either one of you guys in terms of uh, your writing and in really taking good care. I mean, months went into the preparation of of these podcasts. So I just want to commend you both because Gary and Randall are the writers of this podcast, and it really was a labor of love getting this out into the world. It certainly was. And it was an evolution because Randall and I have uncovered so much more information in the five years since I published Icon. As each auction comes to be, there's more and more information. Marilyn saved everything. (laughs) <laughs> and um, thank and, God. And, and everything that, <laughs> yeah. that she saved was secured by Lee Strasberg, who she bequeathed these possessions to. And so they remained secret for 
many years after her death. And so they reveal so much of the truth about Marilyn that previous biographers didn't have access to. So right. in the end, you know, they say the truth always comes out. So Marilyn's voice is finally being heard in her <laughs> own journals and her letters, her correspondence. Mm -hmm. It's all there. It was and just- And not that trash hidden. talk that's out there that, you know, when I hear these uh, tabloids and they'll say Marilyn's diary, and then you, you read uh, what the diary description is and it's like, have you Boy not even, you know, read what, how she writes? She's such a deep thinker and philosophical. It's like she would never write such surfacey, trashy stuff like that. So, you know, for yeah. the for the listener, I think this is going to be an interesting experience uh, for you. So, guys, I think we have wrapped this episode up, and we will look yep. forward to having you join us after you've listened to. Uh, episode seven it'll be uh, coming up if you're listening to these in linear order but until next time remember to hold a good thought for Marilyn, but definitely hold a good thought for yourself <laughs>